My name is Mira. I'm a filmmaker and professor at Coventry University. I've been invited as a guest speaker to do a webinar as part of the Visual Communications Department at Kamal Guru Liberal Arts and Science University in India. I'll be discussing documentary cinema in the disinformation age and showing excerpts of my films Trans India, Maju 9195 and my current project Gorakshaks, The Cow Protectors. Join me this Friday live, 31st July, 10.30 a.m. UK time, 3 p.m. Indian time. I hope to see some of you there. Welcome, welcome, bonjour. A splendid welcome to everyone. You wonder why I varied in languages? It is obvious, because of our participants. As bright as the day, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to our enthusiastic supporters over the globe. This is the impact of media connectivity. There is a golden say, Tamil saying, Kandal kan badam poi, kadal ket badam poi, tira visari padi me, which means what you see is not true, what you hear is not true, what you analyze is from what you hear and see is the real truth. And the real truth is power, and the power is what the media is. This is the reason Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Saints, the Department of Visual Communication, takes this international webinar with international speakers on various issues and create awareness for media literacy. Media studies is not just a degree. It should showcase the reality. Here, a path is created through each individual in the society we succeed. Each person carries the responsibility to explore media, the powerhouse of actuality. We are in the fifth day of the webinar, and we have a speaker from UK, Professor Mira. To know more about the speaker, let me hand, the, hand over the session to Ms. Magdalene. Over to you, Ms. Maggie. Thank you. So, documentary is a term that stresses the recording or documenting function of the camera. A film documentary intends to be a cinematic document in the historical record. Cinema verite is the type of documentary film that includes no narration, which an expert is skilled at. The camera simply floors or follows the subject and she becomes the voice through her lenses to the voiceless communities. One famous example of such a film in the world is Don't Look Back, a biography film of Bob Dylan, covering the tale of the United Kingdom in 1965. Notably, Ivan Mira is from United Kingdom. Her award-winning film, Transgender or Trans India, speaks the reality of hijras. It also won the Royal Television Award in United Kingdom. Her films are been nominated in several international film awards and screened all over the world. Mira has also won Best Short Documentary at the Kashis Mumbai LGBT Festival in India. And she was also nominated for the Sky Atlantic Grissom Award. She is an alumni of the Gurusin Dog Lab in association with Ratta Dog House as well as one World Media Fellow. Documentary filmmakers seek to render the world as they see it and one such filmmaker among us is Meera Darshi who strives and hopes to create change through an immense art. 
Mira is also a professor at Coventry University. She never fails to fulfill her passion by making others passionate. Welcome you to this virtual dais. Let's hear about documentary cinema in this disinformation age from Mira. Over to you, Mira. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Magdalene, for your kind introduction. It always sounds overwhelming when someone else introduces me and you hear all these achievements, but um, it's been an um, incredible journey so far, and I'm still learning and I'm still experimenting, so I can't wait today to share that with you all. Um, before I actually uh, get into uh, the actual webinar, I do want to say thank you to uh, Kumar Guru College of Liberal Arts and Science um, and especially the uh, Visual Communications Department for organizing uh, such an incredible uh, webinar series, which I think is, is so topical, it's so relevant in uh, today's day and age. Um, and also having a mixed uh, variety of experts talking about different aspects and layers of media. And hopefully I can bring um, you know, new knowledge and contribute to that as well. Um, and of course, uh, I want to thank UNESCO and the News Minute for, again, being part of this. And I'm happy to be part of this prestigious platform. Um, and in particular, I want to thank uh, Mrs. Ananda, uh, Ms. Magdalene and Mr. Leo for uh, welcoming, welcoming me so nicely and um, having me part of this uh, wonderful platform. So I can't wait now to start um, talking about my journey. <laughs> it's a pleasure, uh, Mira. Carry on with your Thank you. So um, before I um, begin to get into the uh, webinar, I want to go through the objectives um, of this webinar, So, uh, which is on the next slide. Um, I wanted to discuss today a little bit about, more about my background in uh, documentary uh, cinema. So in particular, I'll be talking about what is documentary, um, things, uh, notions around the truth. I'll be talking about concepts such as objectivity and subjectivity, um, I guess, uh, verses as well. Um, they do coincide with each other. And there's obviously a lot of challenges within that. So I'll be talking a lot about, um, you know, the challenges that I've faced, um, uh, aspects such as access and rapport and representation. Um, and I'll be showing all of this uh, alongside examples of my own practice, so my own films. And you'll get to see uh, clips as well of um, exclusive clips of films uh, that I have actually made. I'm going to be talking a lot about my filmmaking journey. So I'll talk about, about um, the practicalities of filmmaking. I'll talk about um, what it's like to be a filmmaker out in the field, um, embedding yourself in a new community, um, and just trying to kind of uh, capture objective reality as, as accurately as possible as well. And I, I, want, to, I want you to sort of um, see today as just a way of me kind of ex uh, expressing um, exactly what it's like to be in the field. And of course, there's ups and downs. And I want to show that it's not just glamorous and, you know, the um, awards are obviously rewarding, but there's obviously a big layer of, you know, having impact and, um, you know, conversations like this to actually create some kind of change. Um, and hopefully, I'll, when I, if I have time, I should do, I'll finish off with talking about the future of storytelling and um, some new research that I'm kind of getting involved in um, on concepts of immersive film and sensory practice as well. So um, the next slide. So uh, what is documentary? So um, documentary is um, basically the, the background that I'm uh, part of. Um, I've actually began a uh, documentary when I started uh, university. So just wanted to backtrack a little bit before I actually get into the definition of uh, documentary cinema. I wanted to just talk a little bit about how I actually ended up where I am now and um, as a professor and, and a filmmaker. Um, you know, I've always been fascinated with film and storytelling. And uh, this was quite evident when we were watching some home movies the other day where I noticed that I wasn't actually in the videos and it was because I was always behind the camera trying to kind of capture that memory and save it and record it. So I guess this idea of visuals and, and audio has always been part of me, but I never really knew it until I actually started studying media at school, which I was fortunate that the school actually had that subject. Um, I went to, uh, I began uh, studying media also at college, which is before university here. 
Um, and I continued to um, make projects. I continued to um, kind of experiment with editing and, you know, pick up a camera and start kind of shooting around um, and kind of just thinking about what is my purpose. It wasn't until I went to university uh, where I actually was introduced to documentary cinema uh, by my mentor, Ken Farrow. And at the time then, um, I didn't really know what it was, but um, as soon as I was introduced to all these different modes, uh, which I will discuss in a short while, it was only then I realized the, the power of documentary. Um, and ever since then, I um, did do my master's in 21st century media practice. And um, since I have, um, I am an independent filmmaker and I'm also a lecturer um, across three different degrees. So I teach on the masters in media practice and two uh, bachelor degrees, media production and digital design consultancy at Coventry University. Um, so in the next slide, um, I'm gonna be talking now um, a little bit about documentary cinema. So what is documentary? To be honest, whenever somebody asks me this, I don't really like to give a definitive definition because it's like someone asking you, what is media? Media is everything. What is art? Art is everything. It's everywhere. And that's the same for a documentary. It's, it, it allows people to gain an insight into a new world. Um, it's informative. Documentaries are engaging. They're um, sometimes entertaining. There is space to um, learn new knowledge. And I think that's, that is what is the most important aspect of documentary. It's not just solely facts and information and data, but it's actually how is this information, how is this data being presented in, um, in a truthful way to actually create an experience. So as I've been making more and more documentaries, I've, I've stopped seeing them as just sources of information, but actually pieces of art. And I think that's, that's what people should start seeing them as, as a place for um, not just learning about something new, but actually um, immersing yourselves into someone else's lives and um, understanding something or taking away something that you never really knew existed in the first place. Documentaries though, to me personally, are um, a form of truth. Actually, when I was studying documentary at university, um, and I'm going to be very honest here as well, because a lot of uh, people maybe my age or younger or who are studying uh, film or media may also have the same feeling. But at the time, I always kind of overlooked documentary. It, it, to me, it was very linear and conventional, but it was because I was only exposed to certain types of films at the time. And that was the media that I was exposed to. Um, and it wasn't until um, uh, my mentor at university actually introduced me to different modes of documentary. I didn't even know that there were different types of, of documentary films. You know, uh, Bill Nichols, uh, a theorist, uh, explains these different modes. I'm not going to go in, into them in detail, um, but just um, to mention a few, um, you know, performative, there's expo expository mode, there's um, observational. And all these documentaries are different. So some are based on archives, some are based heavily on visuals. Some films you may see and they may be entirely interview based, but they are different layers of this. So documentary is such a big term, but within that there are so many different strands. Um, and the strand that I'll be focusing on is cinema verite. Before I go into talking about cinema verite, um, I just wanted to emphasize again, um, documentary you know you're taking someone's life you're capturing it and you're presenting it to the world and um, as I've been in the field and as I've actually taken my camera and you know filmed these communities I've noticed that as much as I'm filming their lives and their experience I'm learning so much about me and myself and there's so many different emotions you know there's there's shocking moments there's there's tiring moments there's there's risks, there's, there's life and death moments. And what I want to do with my films, with, with my art, is to express that, is to translate all of those experiences, all those relationships I've built, those, uh, the culture, the language, the place, the hardships, the happiness, um, the labor, the struggles, the conflict, all of that within the screen. Because at the end of the day, you know, yes, documentary is a source of information. It is it is data, um, it is factual, but it's how that information is represented 
in a visual way which can create impact and so i see documentary as as a as an experience as a form of escape so moving on to the next slide um i want to just uh talk a little bit about the mode cinema verite uh which is um something that I've adopted in my own practice. So verité in French uh, means uh, truth. Um, another word for it is direct cinema, uh, direct cinema movement. So you may have heard of those terms. Uh, something that strands off of that is observational film. Um, and so those kind of terms fall under cinema, verité. And it was a concept developed in 1950s and 60s um, by filmmakers uh, like Albert Maisels and Frederick Wiseman. And um, these are some of the techniques that they followed. Um, now, you, you may be quite, you may be thinking that, you know, is this like, you know, set down? Is it very strict? It's not. But what these filmmakers wanted to do was that they had documentary as a medium, as a platform to tell stories. But what they noticed was missing was, was pure reality, was, was truth, um, you know, actuality. And so they were trying to try to think about how can we actually achieve the truth through film? Because there's still, you know, layers. It's not just the, the community or the subject, the person. There's a layer of the camera, then you have the eye and you have the human. And even then afterwards, it's through a screen that they are presented. So you they wanted to kind of strip back um, on all these kind of notions that I'd build around cinema. And so they called it zero. And in that sense, what they meant was that, you know, the filmmaker um, stripping back of all these kind of aspects that they're so used to, such as no lighting, having no tripod, no staging, and uh, being as, as pure as possible. What they suggested was that, you know, even by having a tripod, you are, um, you're, you're kind of, you're immediately, when you have a tripod, you're, you're planting it in a particular place and immediately automatically you start to think about reality and you start to construct it because as soon as you put the camera in, a, in the tri tripod in a particular place you start to think about the shot and as soon as you start to think about it then what they argued is that you're breaking reality and so if you think about real life you don't have time to pause and place a tripod and film what's happened. You have to just film it as it is. And that's why, you know, they, at the time then they had very big cameras so they put them on the shoulder. Now we have shoulder rigs. Um, so the same sort of thing, just an extension of the arm really. And um, what, what they wanted to emphasize was that it doesn't matter if the camera shakes or there's a few moments where it goes in focus and out of focus that's reality, that's what happens in life. You know, when we're walking or driving or looking out the window, there might be something that, you know, happens. There might be something that um, you might be walking and it might shake a little bit, but all those little moments are, are truth. And it was only then I, I sort of kind of understood that actually, wow, that's, that's really true. And when I started watching these films, I, I noticed that I started to build a connection with them. So another element, uh, a technique of cinema verite is, is avoiding narration. It's avoiding voiceover as well as interviews. Um, now, this is not necessarily saying that interviews are not the truth, because actually for me with Transindia, um, I had to rely on interviews. I had to rely on dialogue because of their stories. It had to be through voice. But what, they, what cinema verite is suggesting is that why can't you try and capture their story without um, putting the subject in a position where you have to ask them a question. You know, you may, they may be walking and naturally they might turn around and tell you about a memory or um, their favorite color. And those moments, those unexpected moments are moments of truth, uh, which you try to capture. So Cinema Verite is, you know, ideally tries to minimize that. In the slide next, um, I'm not going to go in detail, but um, you'll see um, a few images here. And these are three films which, at the time I was studying uh, documentary, I was um, I watched these three films. And if you if you're not familiar with cinema verite or you want to kind of understand a little bit more um, about the actual practice behind it, then I would definitely recommend these three films: uh, Grey Gardens by Albert Maisel's. Uh, Frederick Wiseman's Titicot Follies and Chronicle of a Summer by Jean Rouche. 
Um, there are plenty more, um, but these were the three that really inspired me. You know, they were filming uh, for longer durations, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on. Um, but I tried to adopt um, these techniques with my film. So my first film, Trans India, um, in the next slide, you'll see a, uh, a still from the film. Trans India was my first, um, I guess, a big documentary that I made. Um, it was actually my final project at university. And um, at the time that I started uh, researching the attitudes of sex and sex culture um, in India, and I started looking at the current attitudes of this, and I started to notice a big shift within, um, uh, you know, you know, them discussing it within spirituality and religion. Um, and this led me to looking at uh, sexualities. Um, and at the time then, when I was um, researching Trans India and, and the Hijras, I actually noted, uh, I came across, there was a lot of protests with the Homosexuality Act. Um, and there was a lot of uh, um, sort of uh, news happening around that time. And then someone did mention to me, or I came across Hijras or something had happened where I happened to just kind of research them or find out about them. And I started thinking about, actually, have I met Hijras before? And, you know, I've traveled to India many times uh, with and without a camera. And the times where I, where I was just going to India to visit family, it was, um, I did come across Hijras and I spoke to my family and I, I started thinking about, you know, how are they represented within society? Um, and a lot of my thoughts were based on negative misconceptions. Um, and immediately I started to become curious. And uh, my curiosity led me to uh, researching them fully. And I found some incredible facts about um, the hijras. So hijras are um, neither male nor female. They identify as women. And um, they are usually associated with the umbrella term of transgender. Um, but actually, they are, the correct term for them would be hijras as well. And when I was researching um, hijras, I actually found um, so many incredible facts. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the research because, you know, when you're making a film and you're um, trying to take information and present it, firstly, you need to know the information. You need to know what exists, um, not just online, in print, but in society, you know, what is what are people saying about it? Because all of that um, has an impact with then, you know, where is that where is that gap? What what is missing in terms of knowledge? Uh, and what is your responsibility to then kind of bridge that gap between knowledge or whether it's to uh, break a stereotype or um, to confirm certain facts? And uh, many years ago, Hijras were actually in Mughal Empire, they were accepted they were respected and because they were um, seen as uh, in neither male nor female, um, they were trusted with the princess in the palace. It wasn't until uh, when Britain colonized India, uh, they saw them as a threat. And unfortunately, uh, the British Raj introduced the Criminal Tribes Act in 1871 um, and, and all Hijras were um, unfortunately um, associated as being, as being criminals. Um, and um, I actually found the actual law, which was very shocking to me. So um, you, as you can see here um, in the next slide, you'll be able to see the actual law, which I found. Um, so I'm just going to paraphrase, but it's, it said, um, you know, in section 26A, um, any hijra that's seen um, singing or dancing, um, ornamented or dressed uh, like a woman uh, will be fined or imprisoned or even both. And um, when, in the next slide, when you actually look at the actual law itself, you'll notice that, um, you know, when I, when I saw it myself, like actually there, I was thinking, wow, this, this actually happened. This, this, you know, this existed. Um, and it was really shocking to me. Um, and I, I began connecting with the story so much more. Now, although this act was repealed in 1952, as we know, you know, ostracism has a lasting effect. And this has, had, this has had an impact on the hijras in society. And ever since, they've really struggled to find a place in society. Um, in 2013, they were recognized as, um, by the Indian Supreme Court as officially the label of the third gender, which is remarkable and a great achievement for the hijras. 
But actually, as I started digging further and further, um, they still lack basic human rights, which are not really being addressed. So I had all these kind of, uh, this research that I'd done on them. It wasn't just history. I, I looked at their culture, their language, their identity, how I should approach them, how I should speak to them. Um, I looked at accounts online, other people's encounters with them. A lot of it was negative. Um, and so then I started thinking about my own purpose. You know, why, why do I want to make this documentary? Um, you know, all of this in the media and popular culture exists where they are being represented as negative. Is, is it true? You know, what is the truth? And so I wanted to go out in the field and actually, you know, I just said to myself that, do you know what, I'm going to go and see who are the Hijras, you know, from scratch, what do they actually do? Um, they're associated with having this uh, special power, this special gift to bless bride and grooms. Um, they're quite religious, so they believe in the, the Mataji, which is the mother goddess, and that's where their, their, their power comes from, their form comes from. And so I just wanted to find out, you know, are these misconceptions, um, what are they based on? Are they accurate? Um, a lot of people had said to me, when you go, um, don't look at them in the eye, they'll curse you. Or if they come to a wedding and they lift up their skirts, it's bad luck, so give them money. And there were so many, so many kind of strange things that I'd, I'd been hearing. And so to me, it was actually, you know what, I just want to go there and take my camera and, and film them for themselves and see who they are. And as well as um, emphasizing how fundamental research is, so yes, understand the history, the laws around uh, the topic, um, prejudice they face. I also had to research, you know, um, the biology. So it, you know, I had to research the castration process. What is it that they go through? You know, um, you know, do they actually uh, fully transform into a woman? You know, there's so there's so many layers within that. And if I didn't know that, if I didn't know those understanding or that research before, I wouldn't have been able to make the film that I have done. I wouldn't have been able to ask certain questions that I have done. And so um, research is absolutely fundamental, regardless if you're capturing visuals, um, not necessarily, you know, it's as easy as taking your camera, pointing and shooting. You still have to know background knowledge on your topic. So I'd like to show you a clip of Transindia, and then I want to discuss more about representation. I'm a guru to him. I'm not jela. I'm a guru. I am not jela to him. I am not jela to him. I am a reiti. Magina kaisi. I'm a bugger loco. Kevin. Mangu to Amaro Tardi Dodge Bugwane Awo. To Mangu Gomet Nakem Nagama. Mangine to Sukari, Asabai Makao Sukar to De and Pagarta Pananati. Sarkar, Sarkar Pagarapa, to Omne Mangunati gum to. So that's a very short clip from the film itself. Um, the entire film is actually uh, based, so there's actuality, there's visuals, um, you see them singing and dancing, and uh, we go to weddings and they're dancing with newborn babies, and it's so incredible and so colorful. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of interviews and they're talking about everything that I've discussed, the research around um, the, the laws, uh, they talk about religion, they talk about um, society as well. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, disinformation age, actually, and how this ties in really well with um, documentary cinema. So as we know, um, it's, it's, it's quite obvious we're living in an age we have been done for so long that um, you know, we're living in a disinformation age where we're constantly being surrounded by media, which um, unfortunately there's a lot of fake news, 
There's a lot of misleading facts. There's a lot of information which we don't really know is accurate. And uh, we start to question, you know, what is the truth? Uh, what media can we really rely on? Where can we actually get um, a source of knowledge? And one way, one medium is through documentary. So when I was filming Trans India or any, any film, any documentary that I make, I have to really consider ethical issues, especially with representation, because I'm presenting knowledge through film. And the truth is, is that not everyone knows who the Hijras are. Um, those who may are uh, watching right now, some of you may have seen them, some of you may have may know something about them, some of you may have never heard of them before. And so if you haven't, this is your only source of knowledge, this is the only way you're going to see them. And obviously sometimes, most of the time, we can't travel halfway across the world to actually um, spend time with the community to see the truth ourselves. And so we rely on media, so we rely on documentaries for our source of information. And that's why it's really important that what you represent is very accurate. And so you have to remain accurate throughout. And so it's through the cameras, through the lens, through the eye that I try to um, not just capture um, you know, them singing and dancing, because that's a really big part of their identity, but actually moments where there's hardships, maybe emotional moments, uh, filming, um, I filmed their, uh, some of their mothers who are talking about uh, struggles with um, being accepted in society, uh, being shunned from society. They talk about, um, you know, LGBT and, and wider context. And so it's really important that you understand that when you are there and you're filming, that you have a really big responsibility um, because you, you know, what you see is what the world will see. And so you're shaping this reality through your eye. And so when I, when I am making films, um, I have to kind of think about that responsibility. And although it's quite a big weight on my shoulders, it's, it's not to see it as, a, as a negative um, aspect. It's actually quite incredible that you have the power to actually create new knowledge or fill that gap of knowledge and present this to the world. You're able to take that community and show them to somebody else that never really knew they existed. And so I, I, I try to uh, always consider, you know, you don't want to mislead the audience with inaccurate um, or incorrect portrayals. Um, and what I, I try to do, and especially with Cinema Verite, this is a very big part of it, is to never reconstruct, is to never, never ask them to do anything, never um, tell them anything, so never stage. Um, there was moments where I was filming and suddenly something had happened and my camera wasn't in the right place at the right time and I missed it. Now, although I could say to them, could you please do that again? Or, oh, I, I missed it. Can you just, you know, repeat that? Well, that's me breaking objective reality. That's me breaking truth. And so then that's not accurate anymore. And so I have to avoid that. And if I've missed it, I've missed it. That's just the nature of um, the practice. So um, I want to talk a little bit about impact on, on the next slide. Um, you'll see a few images uh, which are all different strands of impact. Um, and I, you know, this comes back down to why I make documentaries in the first place. And I, I've been talking a lot about you know, presenting information accurately. I've talked about um, trying to uh, present uh, uh, the truth as well. And ideally, you know, when, I, when I think about documentary and why I make films, um, you know, as Magdalene did mention uh, in the introduction, I actually um, started to think about, you know, there is a, a greater deal than just the knowledge and just the facts. It's my experience. It's, it's also that I want to create some kind of change. And I've always said this, that one day I want to, uh, I want film to have that much of power that it, that it changes a, a particular law, which is, which shouldn't exist, or a dated law which isn't being addressed. And although that seems like a very big milestone, there are small milestones in between which I can achieve. And as you can see in this photo here, um, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to take the film um, across the world. You know, I was invited to Canada to do a talk. Um, I, I've been able to take the hijras to places that they will not be able to go to. And receiving, um, you know, tweets and messages where people have said, actually, you know, it's really nice to see accepting parents. And it's true in my film, you do see two mothers who are very accepting. 
um, of their children. And it's, it's really beautiful. And actually, um, I, I don't want to kind of emphasize that, you know, it's, it's not just a big impact. It's just being part of that conversation. And um, yes, I've won awards and it's very, very nice to win awards. But for me, what's more rewarding is that when someone watches my film um, and they say to me that, do you know what? I, I never really knew that hijras were like this or I never really understood them. And because the truth is, if you don't understand something, how can you accept it? And that is bottom, bottom line, the truth. You know, our, what we understand, we accept. And so if I put this in with, with the hijras, if you don't understand them, you ne can't necessarily not accept them, but you don't really get them. And so there's that gap, there's that distance. So I wanted to bridge that gap. And so the film takes you on understanding. So they talk about castration process. They talk about why they curse or if they do, they talk about the luck they can give. So we go through birth, through marriage into the community. You see archive. They talk about death. You know, you, you, they talk, they, you see their parents. So it's an entire journey. Um, and so um, I just want to move on to the next project, uh, Maju 9195. Um, access with, with, with the hijras was, uh, was not easy, but it was easier than um, the women in Maju 9195. Um, with the hijras, I was fortunate enough to, um, one of my family members knew some hijras they added me on WhatsApp. And um, ever since, before I actually traveled to India, they would message me on WhatsApp and they would say, they'd say, hi, Mira, hi, sister. We can't wait for you to come. And I built this rapport with them. So rapport is really important because you have to build that trust. You know, you're going into, you're, you're a stranger to them. So you're going into their lives. And so you have to really um, make sure that what you um, that that trust that you build, you you sh you become genuine and that you actually care about them. So with Majur, uh, Majur actually means laborer um, in Gujarati, and 9195 at the time of researching is actually the daily employment rate of Majurs, the laborers in Gujarat. So I'm filming in I was filming in Ahmedabad in Gujarat, um, and that 9195 is very interesting because it's actually the amount of registered workers. And all the workers that I had filmed were non-registered. So that was quite an interesting statistic because actually a lot of these workers are not registered. And um, that was also one of the challenge because um, they had no phones, um, just one name. They didn't even know their ages. They had no addresses. Um, they were very tight knit community. And these women, they would basically, their, their job, they're construction workers. They build houses, they build luxury apartments, they build commercial uh, retail spaces, malls. And what I wanted to do with this film was to show, um, was, to, was to build a portrait of this women, the hard work that they do. So when I was trying to get access, it was challenging because I visited construction sites and um, a lot of the time, the, the managers thought I was um, the media trying to expose them because they had a lot of raids. And although I guess I am still the media, I'd said to them that I'm not that kind of media. I'm you know, independent filmmaker. And actually, I'm not making a film about you. I'm not making a film about your company. I'm making a film about the women. So yes, there will be aspects of health and safety and dangers, but not the film is not about that. The film is about the labor, the hard work they do. The film is about how they are the, the backbone of India's economy. The film is about how these women are building houses which they will never be able to live in. And that is the harsh truth which this film um, shows. And I want to show you a clip from the film.
Okay, so um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about Cinema Verite and go back to that. So this film was uh, very different, uh, still documentary, very different to Trans India. Um, in fact, that was actually one shot itself. So I think that was around two minutes. I think it does go for a bit longer as well in the, in the film itself. Uh, but actually that's, if you are a filmmaker um, or you do take videos, two minutes is a very long time. And uh, what I was inspired by was Albert Maisel's, um, who actually says the quote, stay with it. And I wanted to just kind of mention that here because I wanted to capture truth as purely as possible. And so one of the techniques in Cinema Verite is to capture longer shots. And so, you know, I could have, um, as the woman is walking, I could take a shot of her uh, putting the sand in the bag. Um, she's walking, I could film a little bit, and then I could skip to the basement. Now that bit in the middle where she's walking through the rubble and go, it goes pitch black, if I put the camera down and I didn't film that, you know, I missed reality. That is, that bit is the truth. And so what I decided with this film, you know, I'm still learning, I'm still experimenting. I decided that I'm going to stay with it. I'm going to keep rolling and see what happens. And actually the truth is, is that I'm trying to express and show the hard work, the labor they do. They don't have breaks in between. So why should the camera? And so, um, although I know it's not a practical to film 24 seven, of course, but I can still try and stick close to the truth. I can still try and get as much as longer shots as possible. And the truth is, is that, you know, when you're watching the clip, it's almost as if, okay, well, we, you know, I, I get it. You start to get this feeling, uh, and I've spoke to a few people uh, and mentors about this, that you're actually watching it and you start to feel almost as if irritated that the shot is too long, almost this essence of, of boredom. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, the whole film is filled with three, four minute shots where they're carrying bricks from eighth floor to first floor, first floor to eighth floor. And you might think, okay, we get it. We've seen it once. Why are you showing it three, four times? But the truth is, is that it comes back to the experience. I want you to experience what the woman is going through. Even myself carrying the camera, walking through, I was tired. I, it, the camera was quite heavy. I was feeling what they were feeling almost. And so I want to translate that onto screen. Art is supposed to make you feel something. So then with cinema, it should do the same thing. And this comes back to something else I'm trying to kind of get into, which is immersive and sensory film. I want you to immerse yourself in a construction site. You know, the sounds, the clangs of the machinery, you can hear the rubble as she's walking. You can, you can hear the sand, the, the texture of it. And all of that, you know, kind of goes back to kind of this, this truthful experience. I faced some challenges when filming Majur. Firstly, the women did not speak in the sense that to me, they didn't really speak. They're not used to speaking to um, outsiders almost. Um, you know, you say to them, how are you? Or what are your dreams? Or, Could you talk about your work? They're not used to that. This is their job. They just do what they do. And so I didn't want to force that. I didn't want to put them in an uncomfortable position where they, they were in interviews or I'm, I'm filming their voices. So is it true that you can only capture truth through voice? Well, don't think of voice as a literal um, concept. Think of it as, um, as, as a, another form. And so I had to heavily rely on visuals um, to represent who they are. And that's why I did uh, long shots as well. And it was through the visuals that you can get that experience. A couple of others, other challenges that I faced was health and safety, uh, remote locations, and um, very difficult to keep track of actually the women. I couldn't find them sometimes. They ended up on a site and it's a massive site. I'm walking, I'm filming, and there's just a hole that's for an elevator that's not yet been put. And I'm walking and you know, my, my, I'm looking at life and I'm looking at life through my lens. And sometimes there's rods that are hitting my leg, I've stepped in glass. So it's not all glamorous, there are risks. Um, but that's all part of the experience and that comes across through the film. So moving on, I want to discuss um, uh, the notions of subjectivity versus objectivity. Um, this is very, very big uh, discussion concept in documentary film. And I wanted to touch upon, um, I put verses there, but actually I, I would change that to just and because they're not, they're not against each other. They work well with each other and there's not one that's right and one that's wrong. And I want to talk about, about that. Um, 
you know, my aim as a filmmaker is to capture objective truth. I'm talking about truth a lot. Um, and you might have heard of the term fly on the wall. And when you actually think about the term, you know, if you're being a fly on the wall, what are you doing? Well, you're there, you exist, um, but actually you're, you're almost invisible um, and you're observing. And so that's what I tried to do with, um, with, with the films that I was making. I tried to be that fly on the wall. Now, the truth is, is that can I still remain objective when I'm, when I'm present? Yes, my presence will have an impact on the visuals I film because it's me, you know, me physically, you know, being a foreigner, dressing in this certain way, talking in a certain way. Yes, I'm speaking Gujarati fluently, but they still know I'm an outsider. So how can I still remain objective when they are aware of my presence? Well, one thing for sure is that, yes, there are health and safety aspects. You know, I could have wore a, a high-vis jacket. I could have wore, um, you know, a hard hat or boots. I could have done all those safety measures, but then I would have been noticeable. And so I want to blend in. So I try to avoid all those aspects as well. Another way to kind of remain objective is I, I try not to intrude or like, you know, interrupt, be intrusive with my camera. I mean, I can't really be invisible. I've got this machine, this camera in my hand, but I can minimize that. I can, I can try and blend in. I can try and, um, try and remain not noticeable, try not to create conflict or, you know, ask questions in a, in a different place or time. I want to talk about my next project, uh, which ties in well with um, objectivity and subjectivity. And this one is um, called Gorakshaks. So Gorakshaks means uh, the cow protectors. And this is a current project. I'm actually, I've been over twice. Um, uh, it's still in production. I'm hopefully going back soon um, to film more. Um, but, you know, Gorakshaks is uh, basically a documentary uh, which follows um, the lives of these volunteers who uh, capture um, illegal trucks who are taking animals for slaughter. So under the Bombay Animal Preservation Act applied to Gujarat 1954, um, the slaughter of cows, bulls and buffaloes is totally prohibited. Um, and if these trucks are caught, then they, um, they can be, the, the people can be imprisoned and, and fined on prob and both actually. And what actually happens, just to kind of explain, um, these volunteers, they get information, anonymous tips, to say that at this certain time, at 3 a.m., going through this toll tax on this highway, there's going to be um, 25 cows in a blue truck. And um, what the Gorakshaks do, they, they gather this information, they gather their volunteers, and they plant themselves on the highway in these places and um, as soon as a truck goes by at that certain time, 3, 4 a.m., they chase it. Now, um, they can just go and catch it, but obviously this is an illegal act, uh, what the trucks are doing. And so obviously when they do um, chase them, they try to run away. Um, when they do catch them, sometimes there's accidents, sometimes the drivers run away, sometimes they do get away completely. Um, but when they do do catch them and they kind of open up the trucks, um, as you can see in this photo, there are you know, cows on top of each other tied with rope. Um, it's very distressing, actually. And sometimes the animals are uh, dead as well. The police are called um, to investigate, to file reports. And the cows are then taken to a sanctuary where they would get treatment and live the rest of the, the happy lives there. Um, so I wanted to come back to disinformation age um, because this topic is quite controversial. I'm, I'm very aware of that um, because when I was researching the Gorakshaks, in fact, the media had represented them in a very, very negative way, um, associating them with um, violence, uh, religion, politics a lot of the time. And with my films, I, I don't really want to go into politics um, at all. Um, I just want to present the information, the truth as it is, and then people can decide, you know, what, what, what they want to take from it, what information they want to extract from it. And so what I tried to do, similar to Majur 9195, I um, started thinking about my purpose and, you know, why am I making this film? Is it to, you know, um, break down these negative labels or is it to recreate them? But then is that really my responsibility? 
Um, so in the next slide, you'll see a photo of um, the team, the Gorakshak's team. Um, and actually, um, well, before I actually filmed, I was quite nervous because the Gorakshak's obviously had been associated with all these kind of um, politics. And in my head, I was thinking, um, is this the film I want to make? It's, is this what I want to get into? Is it safe for me? When I went there and I, I sat in the car and I met them, they were so welcoming, they were so nice. And one thing that I noticed that was that their main aim was to save the cow. So they'd always say, you know, like the Hijras would say, Jay Mataji, they would say Jay Gomata, which means hail mother cow. And I noticed that actually in the, in the, um, like in the objective, they weren't aiming to um, create war or create any kind of religion. I mean, I did talk to them about this. They actually just wanted to save the animal. And so I started thinking about my purpose and I realized this film isn't about politics. It's not about religion. It's not about, um, you know, violence. It's actually, the film is about the animals. The film, the subject is the animal, what it goes through. And um, before I go and talk a little bit more about the practicalities of filming and the risks, I want to show you a clip from the film. Information, गाड़ी नहीं करवाने चाह, जीवता नहीं। पायलटिंग ने जवाब दिया ना, पची थी आप ये गाड़ी कर ले, अन्य आप लोगों पीछो करी ना, आप लोग पकड़ी ले ये। so um Again, this is um, very exclusive material, actually. The film has not even been released. It's not even been completed yet. It's in development. Um, so this is um, just part of um, an experience that I had out of several many chases as well. And I'll talk a little bit about the risks in a moment. Um, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, objectivity again and how, although it was very challenging, um, I try to tr film as much as possible, you know, the whole journey. So there'll be moments where we're in the car and they're talking about what they're going to do, strategizing. Then there's moments where we're chasing them. Then there'll be moments which are unsuccessful. So I won't just include, um, you know, the, the successful missions. It will also be, you know, the hardships they face the conflict with police, you know, there'll be a, a lot of different layers as well attached to this. And yet, like I said, I'm still yet to film. So there'll be more um, experiences that I'll, I'll be going through. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm not a machine, you know, the, the, the camera is a machine, but, you know, the camera has empathy, it has a heart technically, because it's me behind it. So any anything I film will sometimes have, you know, an aspect of subjectivity. And I, I, that's why I don't want to attach negative um, associations with the word subjective because you shouldn't really shy away from it. And I'm acknowledging that, you know, even as an animal lover myself, it was very emotional to see the animals. And so will that come across the film? It will. So there will be strands of subjectivity. But that's why I'm saying I'm not going to shy away from that. That is the, the truth. And I can't completely be objective because it's still me behind the camera. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about um, perseverance and risks that I took with Go Rakshaks. Um, it's a very, very risky film. Um, I'm, I'm putting myself in, in a life and death situation and I'm aware of that. 
you know, I'm, I film my, all the documentaries myself uh, on camera, uh, but with the girl rock shucks, you know, I don't have time to think about the shots. I don't have time to um, rest. We're filming a lot of the time in the night. The truck might go 3 a.m., 4 a.m., sometimes 9 a.m. I have to be ready. So I'm sitting in the car with, with all these people. Sometimes I'm at the back of the pickup trucks and I, I have my camera strapped with me. I have my batteries charged, the LED panel ready. I have to make sure my mic is charged. And I want to talk about the, the practicalities of being a filmmaker because it's not pretty, you know, I, I didn't have much sleep. Um, there was moments where we barged into an electric pole. Um, I'm filming, the truck in front of us is throwing bricks um, and I have my camera. I have to make sure that it, it doesn't hit the camera and forget me. <laughs> um, but there's so many different risks that I took, but I always kind of think about, you know, why am I doing this? And it's, if I don't make this film, then nobody else will. And that is the motivation that drives me. And that is the risk that I'm willing to take um, in order to, to capture the truth. Because we are living in a disinformation age where sometimes there's small bits of truth and too much disinformation. And so I feel like, I have that responsibility to keep that verite going um, in order to like, you know, make sure it, it's, it still exists and it doesn't get forgotten about. There are also safety measures, you know, I'm traveling in these cars, I sometimes no internet, I have to climb on pickup trucks, as you can see in this photo. Um, so we rescued 32 buffaloes, they were waiting for the police and the time I wanted to film. So, okay, I'll do it, climbed on it went through, filmed the cows, very hard, my hands shaking, because firstly, I haven't really eaten much, haven't slept much. Secondly, seeing the distressing animals is quite um, quite an image, but I need to do it, I, I need to capture it. So keep that to one side, emotion, just be brave and just keep filming. Um, and what I would do every now and then, and I would send my locations via WhatsApp to families so they know where I am in case wherever I am. So just to sort of finish off, um, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about future of storytelling, um, then we'll have some time for questions. Um, so I've talked a little bit about um, you know, documentary as a, it's a physical form film. I want to talk about the future of storytelling. I've actually been experimenting in interactive documentaries. So especially in the situation we are right now, you know, um, with, with this current situation, it's sometimes hard to go there and um, go to a certain place. I mean, some places we still can't even travel to right now. So how else can you tell stories? Well, there is um, software called Clint, which I've actually been uh, teaching and experimenting with. And what this does is this is the, um, this image here is actually the, the back end of Clint. And uh, you're able to create non-linear stories, narratives, um, and the beauty about this uh, uh, project is in, if you go to the website Kino Praxis uh, later on, you'll be able to see all the projects that I've, I've designed and created. Um, but what, what Clint does, what interactive storytelling does is that it takes all this information, all these visuals, these sounds, these interviews, and it builds this archival space, uh, which is on the web and it's accessible to everyone. And it's using new tools, new technology to create an experience, to create a user experience uh, and user journey. Um, so if you imagine it as if a page where there's buttons taking you through different locations, different sounds, you're able to see images, you're able to read about um, the, the communities, you're able to watch films. And it's um, something that I'm, I'm kind of getting into along with sensory practice, again, which is trying to um, unravel those visual mediums, those layers of senses to create a um, visceral experience. So if you, if you do, if you, this is probably a whole another webinar talking about um, new tools and technology, um, but this was just something I wanted to mention that although you know, we're in a situation right now, you don't have to you necessarily go and film, uh, be in the field. You can still tell stories online and be creative as well. So kind of thinking about how can you tell a story through using 
buttons and images and there are different ways of doing that and you'll see um, if you go into that link you'll be able to watch a few projects that I've done in fact one project we just did on my on the master's course was a whole uh, project called anti-isolation zones which is the uh, 16 students actually made films in lockdown in different creative ways um, so I just want to finish off with um, some advice um, and just some practical advice um, when you, if you are a filmmaker or you're still studying or any, if you want to pick up a camera and go make a film or anything, or you make any kind of media, um, you don't have to film big communities and big topics. Obviously, the three topics that I've filmed are, are, are fairly big. They have a lot of history and a lot of context around them. Um, but actually, you can make a film by anyone. There's a story everywhere. And you need to just look and listen. And this is what my mentor says to me, open your eyes and open your ears. You know, you could film the, the, the car mechanic next door or the, the painter that you see paints every day. There's, there might be something there. It doesn't have to be a feature film. It could be a two minute piece. Um, but always kind of, why are you telling the story? Always have some kind of purpose, some kind of impact um, within your media. You know, you're not just, doing it as a form of entertainment you know you're presenting knowledge so what knowledge do you want to present what do you want the audience to take away from it do you want them to feel something do you want them to sh to kind of understand something do you want to change a particular law always have this kind of notion in the back of your mind and that will help you to uh, make a better film and lastly um, just embrace who you are um, I make a lot of films in India um, I'm born and brought up here, but there's something about India that fascinates me. I love India um, and I, I sort of see myself as this kind of what is my mother tongue? You know, I speak Gujarati, I speak English and I, I'm trying to embrace that, you know, embrace the context, you know, the access you have. Because the truth is, is that you have that particular access, that particular upbringing, that those beliefs that I wouldn't. So you could probably make a better film on that subject matter that I could. So try and stick with what you know and embrace that. And don't, don't shy away from that because not everyone has that same eye or that same vision. Um, that is it for, for today. I hope you've enjoyed that. And I'm, um, I'm excited to answer some questions now. Okay. Uh, as per the student's concern, like people see like media's glamour, media's fantasy, but after your presentation, I can tell them, like they can watch out or they can know this is real media. This is where this webinar is meant for. This, meant, this webinar is meant for search of truth, the role of media, the, the so-called the digital and media literacy in this disinformation age. This is what exactly you put it. Really, Mira, it was amazing. Hats off. Best wishes for your current project as well as for the uh, forthcoming projects. Uh, without wasting time, let's take the question. Before that, let me put one question uh, <laughs> from uh, my, my, my personal question. Okay, before I, like, uh, um, like when you take up this risk, like you have seen uh, some of the lines where you know, like it's going to be danger. Like you crossed it, being a British, you come there, you have studied the rules. You know how how worst it can get into, and I'm sure like our media is also have the best way of portraying. So how do you actually pack up your mind for that? Okay, like being, well, you, you have to be a psychological fight, right? You need to know that. Uh, yeah. How do you prepare yourself, first of all? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to actually mentally prepare yourself because before I actually went there, I had seen videos online of them do, doing the rescues and chasing. So I was sort of familiar with what happens in the process. But when you see something and you, when you're in that situation, it's two different, completely different things. So in that sense, when I saw it, I was like, okay, I know what I'm getting into. It's going to be risky and it's fine. And I've, I'm, always, I'm kind of in the most humblest way, like in that sense, I'm quite brave and I would just kind of go for it. You know, I'm not afraid of heights or anything. I'm just going to go into it. When I do make my films before I actually, when I go into the community, I actually f spend time with them without a camera. I think that's really important for rapport and access to show that I genuinely care. It's not just about the video. I, I want to experience what you, you guys are experiencing. So when I first time went there, I didn't have my camera or equipment. I sat in the car and they were very protective that, Mira, are you going to be okay? And I said, yeah, I'll be fine. 
And then when we drove, you know, over a hundred and all this, my heart was racing and I was looking for the seatbelt. <laughs> there was no seatbelt. Um, and it was that time where I thought, no, do you know what? It's scary, but I, I, I want to do this. And so it was, it was actually experiencing that, that I prepared for it. I knew what I was getting into, but I, I, I knew what that, there were risks involved, but I have to do this. Okay. Uh, let's take the questions from the audience. How do you select your project? Which parameters inspires you? For the Gorakshuk project. So thank you, exactly. Hiren, um, for your message, uh, for your question, sorry. Um, so this project was actually, um, I came across uh, Neha Patel, which um, on Facebook, and I saw, actually, personally, I'm an animal lover, I'm also a vegan, and I've been doing a lot of animal activism, personally. And so I, uh, I'm uh, aware of all these kind of, I see all these videos on, on a daily basis. And I remember seeing this video of um, a chase in the nighttime, and I saw these Gorakshuks, um, and and I saw she, she lift, them lifting up the truck and these calves stacked upon each other. And immediately I just thought, wow, what is happening? And it only had a couple hundred views at the time. And I thought, this seems like really hard work. This seems like very brave people to do this. I started researching the laws that actually it's illegal in, in Gujarat to do this. So why is this happening anyway? And as I started researching more and more, I realized that actually there's so much more to it. Um, I got in touch with them and I said, it would be very interesting for me to make a film on you and to come along with you and to see what it, what's been happening. And like I said, in the media, I, they didn't show the, the chase. They don't show it. They just show what they want to show. So I wanted to show that so that that inspired me more to go and film them. Okay. Uh, so let's take the next question. It's from Revati. On what basis do you choose themes for your documentaries? How do you keep yourself motivated? That's one of the best questions. <laughs> uh, keep motivated up to a society specific to your stereotypes mm -hmm. despite the practical challenges. Okay, so there's kind of like two questions there. Thank you, Revati, for your question. Um, so in terms of themes for my documentaries, you know, um, there was this quote, I didn't include it in the presentation, but it's not necessarily that you choose your subjects, the subjects choose you. And I think naturally, and um, I've just by fate, maybe I've been able, the subjects have naturally come to me. So it, with the transgender or the hydras, um, they, they came to me when somebody had mentioned them and I started thinking about my own encounters and that led to something. Choosing the women construction was actually when I was filming the hydras, I kept seeing women carrying bricks on their heads in saris. And I remember taking a photo when I was traveling in the car and I remember then when I came back um, home, I look, was looking through my photos and I saw these images and I thought, wow, this would, be, this would be an interesting project. And so sometimes it's just naturally that, I don't know, I've been fortunate that the topics I've chosen are very topical. And, um, you know, there's also aspects of women empowerment. And even as a, as a female filmmaker, you know, kind of doing, you know, with the camera and, and things, I wanted to kind of show that aspect through uh, the women laborers. So that is something that kind of the, the, the ideas kind of come to me and then I do research. And being motivated, um, the truth motivates me. The truth motivates me all the time. We're surrounded by disinformation age and I can't let other generations uh, we can't let that happen, you know, the truth needs to be out there. Sorry. How much of funding part comes in? Because documentary doesn't carry a commercial value. It carries more of truth or more of a, like information part. So we have Simon Varghese from uh, National School of Journalism, Bangalore. Uh, what's your advice to those who want to make documentaries, especially when funding is a major concern in India or for any country for the sake? Um, so with funding, I always I get asked this question about funding, actually, and it is it is really hard. You know, when I made Trans India, I actually self-funded the film entirely. I just needed money to uh, pay for my ticket. And um, I have family in India, so I could stay with them. I'm fortunate to have that. 
But um, in terms of funding, what I did was I did a lot of crowdfunding. So I raised some money online. I built this kind of, um, I guess, um, this this platform around the hijras. I, I built a Twitter. I built a hashtag. As people started to get a, get aware of them, I started to get a lot of feedback, and people were like, "Actually, we're going to you know donate some money here and there." And in that way, I actually built up enough money to pay for my travel um, to India, which was enough for me. Obviously, the other films that I've been doing, um, I've uh, the Gorakshuk's film, I've been supported by One World Media, um, which has been really helpful. But in terms of advice, you know, you don't really need the best camera or money necessarily to make a film. There are stories everywhere. You don't need a HD 4K camera. You just need an eye. And so, if you've got access to that particular person's story, just go there and film, even if it's on your phone. Just, just get out there and, and tell that story in any way possible. That's nice. Okay, one of our, our own students are asking this question now, okay, being an expert, how do you see bringing out the truth in this society? Uh, yes, the, <laughs> I love the answer question. Um, thank you, Ritika, for your question. Um, also, thank you for calling me an expert in cinema parity. <laughs> that feels very like strange and a really big achievement. So, um, yeah, how am I bringing out the truth? Well, I am trying to follow those techniques um, of cinema verite. So as much as uh, research and going out there in the field, what I'm trying to do is constantly thinking about what are the what is the audience going to be seeing? I'm representing this. Uh, these people through your through the through the lens. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to now I'm trying to spend more time in the field. I'm trying to not think of it as a film, but like as an experience that I want to translate through uh, visuals. So it's not just um, presenting the facts, but also trying to show because I'm trying to show what happens in in real life. I can only do that if. I'm there and I know what happens in real life, in reality. I hope that answers. Universities have asked us, to, they want to, in, I mean, they want you to be your, they are a resource person. I will uh, share your details with them. Okay. There's a okay. wide number of comments on that. Okay, that I will do. After the session yes. or during the feedback sessions, we will send uh, the contact details of the resource person. And let's take one question from, uh, from I'm sorry. Okay, ma'am, how do you interesting uh, contains, uh, this is from our student actually, uh, because documentary contains reality and a fact of theme. So um, how do I make it interesting? What is interesting is even with my presentation today, um, I, I try to show a lot of visuals um, to me, um, art is very visual and I want people to see documentary is not a source of, it's factual, but not just data, not just information, but as a piece of art. And so if art is very visual and it can be expressed in different ways, why not bring in all those artistic ways and represent them through visuals? So, um, yes, there's interviews and we see a lot of um, documentaries which are talking heads, but can you do something creative with that? Can you maybe turn it into an animation? Maybe can you bring in facts and but present them in a, in a more kind of engaging way? Or why don't you challenge yourself? If you want to present a fact, challenge yourself. Instead of actually writing it on screen or telling the subject to say it or asking them, could you still show that through a visual way? And that's what I did with Majur. I wanted to show that they are carrying this much weight on their head. Instead of saying that, I try to show that through a very visual way. And so um, what I try to do is make my films very visual. And I try to kind of make the audio another soundscape. So adding that vi visceral um, experience, like I was saying, where you can hear, you know, you, even with the Gorokshas, you can hear the cars, you can hear them shouting at the back. And um, all of that kind of adds to that um, experience and makes it more interesting. Uh, uh, we have uh, a quite number of questions that we got it through uh, I mean, uh, registration forms and we're also taking questions from uh, the chat board. Uh, but we are also running short of time. So we will go for the last two questions uh, so that we, uh, we keep up our time because we plan for one hour. Now, almost every webinar 
session <laughs> is going for one hour, 15 minutes. Today okay. it's going to be one hour, 20 minutes. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> <Sorry. still. laughs> Uh, so we have uh, uh, our own faculty uh, from St. Mary's College, he's our assistant professor, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, how do documentaries teach students to identify overarching patterns in media representation and help them to reflect, reflect upon contemporary social political themes as a young and yet critical maker themselves? A kind of a question that will have a lot of inner meaning. <laughs> yes, um, quite a big question. And um, I'm just thinking about, okay. So um, actually documentaries, yeah, is a very good way of um, you know, teaching students about life, I think, um, generally. Um, like I was saying with, um, there are a lot of um, issues and you know, in every country, there's a lot of things happening politically, economically, socially, culturally. And so when with documentaries, what you're doing is you're presenting all of that to um, to the students, and you're trying to show them that these problems exist, but it's how you, as a filmmaker, kind of position yourself in those gaps of um, in those gaps, and how you bridge those those knowledge between the two. Um, you're obviously trying to represent communities accurately, and I think uh, with students, they they have to start to kind of uh, think about how they look, how they talk to people, how they actually. Um, they, their own beliefs as well and kind of put that to one side which kind of taps into subjectivity and objectivity as well um but just kind of i know this kind of goes off the question slightly but when i'm teaching myself when i've got seminars with my students i actually talk about my own experiences all the time in fact they find that more um useful and more um they learn a lot from my experiences so you know when i've had things like uh, conflicts with police. I've been in situations which are very challenging or risks or violence myself or I've been hurt or anything. I talk about those and I talk about what I did to overcome those obstacles. And it's then when they, after the lecture finishes and they say to me, Mira, I actually learned about something. I actually learned that when I go to a different country, I should know my rights. And I think that is, imp is important because when I was at university, I was exposed to all of these theories and everything, but I wasn't told about the practicalities and now i know that okay i should know my rights i should know about the police i should have contacts i should have a lawyer all those things and i'm still learning as i go into the field okay we will take the last question uh, <laughs> the audience, uh it's already time so we'll take the last question the remaining questions i will uh, post it up to our resource person and then surely you will get back uh, every information through your email. Uh, how do you prevent personal bias in your documentaries? Very ethical question, very important question. Uh, so um, wh what I try to do, and I was talking about this today is, firstly, it's very difficult. Like I said, I'm still a human, I still have a heart. Yes, there's a camera and it's a machine, but I can't help that I've chosen this topic for a reason. I still wanna present something but I can minimize that. And I do that by filming um, everything. I don't choose. And of course, when I'm editing, I'm still, there's a uh, element of selection. So even if I've filmed um, you know, everything and I'm trying to capture objective reality, when it comes into the edit suite, I'm choosing what's, um, what's in, what the audience sees, what they don't. So isn't that breaking, isn't that subjective anyway? So then I'm constantly challenging myself, but actually I'm breaking truth. So how do I remain and like, try to kind of remain objective? Well, try to keep as much as you can in the edit. And of course, like I said, there are personal views and beliefs, but you have to keep that separate. And also not shy away from that, like subjectivity is a, is a bad um, thing, but kind of minimizing it that you're trying to kind of get all different views different layers, different strands of the topic. And you would only know that if you research everything beforehand. Okay, uh, fine. We have come to an end of our show, actually. Uh, we are really, really, it's one of the interesting, most uh, viewed session for our webinar, like your facts, your research, and the knowledge, the level that you shared, it is amazing. I'm sure like for our audience, this is one of the best sessions for them. We had uh, four days, last four days, various fields from like various 
resource person from the various fields shared the knowledge. And to make the best, you, you added one more. And I'd like to thank you in the name of our, uh, from our college, uh, Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science and the Department of Visual Communication. Thank you very much for the session. And uh, dear audience, tomorrow we are going to have uh, the last session of our webinar series. It is from uh, uh, Dr. Alexandria. He is a co-chair of uh, uh, Inisco uh, Galmil. He'll be presenting to us what is the role and responsibility of uh, the organizations of uh, uh, Gabel uh, with reference to me digital and media literacy in uh, this information age. The session will start at 6.30 in the evening in the time. Uh, it will not be a regular time of 3 o'clock because the resource person is from Brazil, so the timing changes. So it will be 6.30 in the evening. Uh, before we go, uh, let me also remind uh, the audience, uh, the feedback session will be shared at the end of the session. Uh, as well as the link will be, I mean, the code will be shared on the screen. Please do watch, please do mention those code so that you are getting your certificates in time. The feedback code is going to be article number 19. Okay, article 19. So the feedback form will be shared in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the in the chat box. Uh, without wasting your time, let me hand over the session to uh, Ms. Maggie for the final part. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. So, Mira, it was really a wonderful session. So, I would like to say a very few words like have faith in yourself to be successful. Art is very visual. I agree it because this media itself is a virtual reality. This is the takeaway I carry from your study. So we are successful with the supporting pillars. I thank our management, Dr. Vigila Kennedy, our principal for our enormous support. Mr. Leo, the person behind this big new beginning. And Mrs. Ananda, who never failed to give a hand on to this show. I extend my special thanks to all our participants who never fail to support ours and surprise us too. We value your responses, save the feedback link and the code for today, Article 19. Stay tuned for tomorrow's show at 6.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Let's respect the reality and make necessary changes to strive ourselves in this society. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alexandre Sayad. I'm the co-chair of GAPMIL and also the head of Zeitgeist, a Brazilian educational consultancy. MIL Alliance, or GAPMIL, it's a UNESCO-led initiative that connects multiple stakeholders around the world on media and information fields to build up a more clear, fair and ethics informational ecosystem. GAPMIL is really proud to be partner of Kumaguru College and its digital webinar series because both of the institutions work for developed professionals focus on ethics for education, information or communication field. Please join the GAPMIL within the UNESCO main website and I see you soon.